Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest is Greg Carpenter, and Greg is the Managing Director for BTI Group M&A, short for Mergers and Acquisitions, a business brokerage firm located in San Jose, California. He has been a business sale intermediary since 1985, only yesterday. That's right. The current focus of his business is on the middle market, valued from $1 million to $50 million. He was on the board of directors for the California Association of Business Brokers for nine years. Uh, Greg is a frequent speaker about how to sell a business, and he's an arbitrator for the California State Bar and the Santa Clara County Bar Association. And Greg says he has a great home at Incline Village at Lake Tahoe that he doesn't get to use very much. Unfortunately. And, yeah. And he does, he does rent it, so, you know, if you get in touch with him, maybe, <laughs> maybe you can have well, thanks, a great Thanks for the plug, Mike. There you go. <laughs> and, and he said after our interview today, he and his wife are going to be taking off to Incline Village. So uh, have a good time, Greg. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Uh, so, Greg, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me here. Okay. Today, or this interview, we're going to be talking about buying a business. Uh, just for your reference, today is June 20th, 2017. We have a few things up in the air uh, with the Trump administration, changes, regulations, and so forth. Most of it isn't going to have that much of an impact on what we're talking about today. Okay, let's go ahead and get started here, Greg. Uh, so what are some reasons that people buy businesses? A lot of folks in the Silicon Valley find when they get uh, start getting a lot of gray hair, they end up being unemployable. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. and uh, You mean like, like you and me? but Like, uh, like us, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, w one good way to replace that lost job income is to buy a small business and, and operate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as the businesses are a little larger and a little larger, sometimes uh, using your business to acquire another business is a way to make it grow faster and speed up the process. Right. Uh, sometimes you might have a business that doesn't have a lot of organization or infrastructure to it, but it's a good business, you might buy a business that has all that organization and infrastructure set up and merge the two of them together rather than try to reinvent the wheel yourself. Uh, from the individual buyer's perspective, the single biggest reason why people want to buy a business is independence and freedom uh -huh. because uh, they don't want to have a boss. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, and they're willing to live with the consequences. Yeah. So the, the only thing that we say is Sometimes they find out that, yeah, they, they got a, a really lousy boss and then they got an even worse employee. But anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately, that can be the case. <laughs> it's true. Okay. Well, we've seen that well, maybe I should first. So, you know, we've had some of these interviews before. What are you seeing probably mostly as far as uh, the people that you're dealing with? Uh, uh, these days, uh, w what seems to be the main motivation that's happening? Uh, it's not all that different uh, than in the long run. Of course, in the days when we were in the recession or right after yeah. the recession and uh, unemployment was high, there were a lot of people who just couldn't find a job and were buying a business when they might not otherwise do so. Uh -huh. Today what we're seeing is more affluent people deciding they've had enough of the corporate life and they really want that freedom. Uh -huh. And maybe they also want to be able to build their net worth to a much higher level than they can by being an employee. Okay. So they've, they've got money, they've got experience managing businesses, they have a good skill set, a great work ethic, and they're just striking out on their own to find a business that they can scale up and grow. Okay. So there are some businesses that you know, it's, it's just sort of a standalone business, like a mom and pop store, or uh, you know, maybe the person has their own auto repair shop or body shop. And then there's others that are like franchise operations. So maybe you could compare a little bit um, some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of the two types of businesses. Well, the the standalone entrepreneurial business is whatever the owner makes of it. <clears throat> it may or may not have uh, good books and records. It may not have good 
reporting and control for all the processes. It may not have professional marketing. And often the owner of a small entrepreneurial business really just runs the business out of his checkbook. And he decides, well, as long as I've got enough money, you know, why should I bother? On the other hand, franchises are organized almost like public companies. They have highly developed management reporting and control systems that enable the operator to keep track of everything that's going on a day on a daily basis and know whether or not it's performing up to par. Franchise businesses tend to average revenues that are 50% higher than similar entrepreneurial sole proprietor businesses. They also have a brand name. For example, if you're traveling in a city where you're unfamiliar and you want to grab a quick lunch, are you likely to go into Sam's Burgers or McDonald's? You don't know what you might get with Sam's Burgers, but if you go into McDonald's, you pretty much know what you're going to get and you'll probably be safe. Yeah, yeah. So you get consistency, but actually Sam's Burgers might be better. Sam's Burgers could possibly be better <laughs> or you might end up getting sick. You don't know. Yes, yeah. so you're rolling the dice. Yeah. And franchises have training. Uh -huh. uh, franchises have support. After all, with hundreds or even thousands of identical units, if your business has a problem, they can compare it to all the other ones and they know right away what the problem is. They can fix it. And when new products come out, they've already been test marketed and proven to work. Whereas if you have your own entrepreneurial business, you try something new, you might just waste a bunch of money. Uh -huh. Okay. So you get a little bit of a picture there. And I think that there's, there's a little bit of a range. I think that some franchises, you have a little more leeway on what you can do with others. But like I, I dealt with one person from a 7-Eleven and everything was like, it, in essence, he, he was buying a job. I mean, exactly. I mean, he, that uh, they took care of the inventory control, uh, you know, and, and all the accounting and everything. It was all built in with the, the cash register and so forth. Really, uh, there wasn't very much in some respects to manage because it was pretty much managed by uh, the 7-Eleven company. 7-Eleven yeah. is a little different animal. Yeah. The operator actually doesn't own anything. Yeah. He doesn't own the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Oh, he doesn't even own that? He doesn't own the inventory. He just gets a percentage of the sales for running it. So it's really not like a traditional franchise. Uh -huh. And you raise a good point, though. All franchises are not equal. Uh -huh. And there are startup franchises. Then there are, on the other end, highly mature franchise systems, like McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. And McDonald's is also pretty... In fact, they're even trying to get rid of the employees, I understand, in McDonald's. You know, they're going to just have machines that are going to churn out hamburgers. <laughs> so... We'll see how that works out. Yeah, <laughs> even uh, even the coffee shops. There's one in San Francisco that has a robot barista now. Okay. I don't know. You know, it's not going to be like Sam's Bar, right? You're going <laughs> to snuggle up and chat with the, the, the robot. Oh, yeah, well. I wonder if the robot's going to be able to carry yeah. any conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you're a business broker. Why would somebody want to work with a business broker if they're thinking about buying a business? Education and advice is one thing. If you're looking at a range of businesses, you might look at a bunch of tax returns and say, wow, none of these businesses make any money. Well, <laughs> surprise, that's not the case. Yeah. Tax returns, tax reporting, uh, finances are managed to minimize the amount of tax that a business owner pays. It doesn't necessarily give you a good indication of the earning power. So business brokers know how to recast the financials to report uh, the earnings that an owner should expect um, rather than looking at the number that, that you pay tax on, for one thing. Process is another. Uh, documents and forms uh, for writing offers to protect the buyer in the process and make sure the buyer has the opportunity to complete due diligence, get financing, work with the landlord to get the premises lease, maybe even make uh, employment agreements with key employees. Uh, and then selection. Business brokers typically have quite an inventory of many businesses to consider. So you can get through the learning curve quickly by looking at several businesses with a broker. Whereas if you go out on your own and you're talking to people who are for sale by owners, it's just going to be the Wild West. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. So I would think a big part about you know, and, and it probably depends an awful lot. You know, different business brokers uh, 
probably have a little different approaches and maybe even different ethical uh, uh, just like any, yeah, just yeah. like the franchises. Yeah, there are quite a range. There's quite a range of business brokers and, and service standards. Yeah, so you may want to do some due diligence even related to the business broker that you're dealing with. But on the other hand, you know, like if I had somebody like you, I would have a comfort level that okay, here's somebody that's done a lot of these transactions, and and they might have an eye on. Uh, how to spot some of the skeletons in the closet that, that are typically there for a sure. business that you may be thinking about buying. One benchmark for buyers to consider is the amount of uh, information and the number and quality of documents that a broker would provide prior to uh, requiring an offer for the business. And in some cases, many brokers only give a brief summary and they say, well, if you want to see the tax returns or meet the owner, you have to make an offer first. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of those offers end up failing because the buyer really hasn't had the opportunity to understand the business enough uh -huh. to form an opinion of value. Right. Or whether he even wants to own it. Okay. So who usually pays the fee to the broker? Similar agency in business brokerage is similar to residential or commercial brokerage. Typically, the business owner signs a listing agreement with the business broker and the seller pays the fee uh, at the closing. Mm -hmm. And the buyer doesn't pay the fee directly to the broker, but of course the fee is built into the price that the seller accepts because uh -huh. the seller is looking at what he's going to net after the sale. And uh, that doesn't mean, though, that there is no agency relationship between the broker and the buyer. And this is spelled out very clearly in the California Business and Professions Code. So the buyer uh, is represented by the broker, and the broker has a duty to put the buyer's interest first and full disclosure and fair dealing. Okay. Uh, is this arrangement a lot like when you're buying and selling a home? In other words, is it typically a broker that's representing the seller and one for the buyer, or are you sort of handling both sides? In business brokers, the vast majority of sales are dual agent sales in okay. which the broker represents both parties. Part of the reason for this is that there are a lot of details and there are a lot of moving parts and uh, different things to consider. Often cooperating brokers haven't had the opportunity to get up the learning curve enough to really do a good job of representing a buyer and no one knows the business as well as the listing agent. Mm -hmm. Um, so, with these types of uh, arrangements, you know, where again the seller pays the fee and you're doing some dual agency and so forth, do you get like conflicts of interest that come up related to these? Generally not, because it's all about disclosure. Uh -huh. And for example, in our company, we have very thorough documentation and packaging requirements before we would ever put a business on the market. Uh, we wouldn't go to market without having financial statements, tax returns, list of equipment, premises lease, and a write-up about how the business works, uh, its county personal property tax records, business licenses, and, and knowledge of how to transfer these things. So you'll find some business brokers really have hardly any documentation at all, and this makes it difficult for them to do a good job of disclosure, and that's why I pointed out one benchmark for buyers to check when considering which broker to use is how thoroughly they package the business and how well they can comply with the industry standard of care for disclosure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, things to look for. And I would think that it sounds like you guys actually, you're doing some due diligence yourselves in the process of just signing up the client. That's right. We do pre-due diligence, but it's important to note that we don't actually verify the source documents. That's mm -hmm. the job of the buyer and his advi other advisors, like his accountant and his attorney, and possibly some consultants or building inspectors or whatever okay, e expert so, he needs. So, for example, then um, you're not actually checking on the Secretary of State site to see if an LLC registration is current or. Uh, we actually do that. Okay, aha! See? <laughs> but, again, all we have to do there is print out yeah. something from the website yeah. and include it in our disclosure That's package. pretty quick and easy, isn't it? It so, is, yeah. but, but, you know, you have to know to, to do it, and 
as far it's as surprising. Tax it may can be surprising how many, how often you'll discover that uh, the person thinks that he has a corporation, but the, the registration well, it says is expired. suspended. You're yeah. not, the, that corporation is not capable of doing business. Right. And then sometimes that's the beginning of sliding down the slippery slope. We had one case a couple of years ago where uh, the seller's corporation was suspended, and I dug a little deeper, and I found out the seller had not filed any tax returns for three years. Yeah, that's and, a very common And that's reason. why they were suspended. They hadn't yeah. paid the state. Yeah, so the, yeah, so the most common is they haven't filed tax returns, and the other is, is that there's a registration statement a corporation has to do. Uh, and it's not that involved, and but somehow, you know. 25 bucks, yeah, one but, piece of paper. But, but they just sort of, it slips by, and uh, part of the reason is, is sometimes, uh, well, the notification now is coming, I guess, on a little postcard, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's easy to have, let things like that slip by, especially you know when you're uh, you're fighting alligators or whatever you're doing. <laughs> I think a lot of entrepreneurial business owners, as opposed to the more corporate, highly organized ones, think about their next task in terms of, is this immediately going to put any profit in my po pocket or not? Uh -huh. And they tend to push off anything that isn't immediately going to put profit in their pocket. Uh -huh. And sometimes that's even doing their books and records. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Well, um, what other professionals should be involved in helping out in this process? It depends on the circumstances. And certainly you'd need an, an accountant, preferably a CPA, to help you with due diligence on the, the financial books and records, tax returns, et cetera, probably should use an attorney mm -hmm. to review the corporate documents and look into the corporation's history and maybe the owner's history, uh, find out if the owner is someone who's been convicted of a felony, especially financial felony fraud okay. <laughs> in the past. Okay. Uh, and then maybe you don't want to deal with this guy because you don't know what he's hiding on you. Um, you might also need a building inspector because the premises lease often makes the tenant uh, responsible for all the maintenance about the building. And if, for example, a $15,000 air conditioner unit hasn't been maintained for 10 years and it needs to be replaced because the, the current owner hasn't done it, and you take over without knowing that, well, next year you may be spending $15,000 to replace that air conditioning unit. Oh, yeah. So you, you should have the building inspected uh, when you have a triple net lease and make sure that you're not gonna be on the hook for deferred maintenance from the seller. Uh, sometimes you might also need to hire, uh, there's a, a firm, that, uh, several firms that do in-depth background investigation. And you might, if you're gonna be hiring key employees that are essential to running the business, uh, sometimes uh, it turns out they're not people you wanna deal with. and. Uh, it's good to look into their backgrounds, too. Uh, there could be just a whole range of folks you need to help you, uh, advise you, depending on all the circumstances. Yeah. So it's sort of a look before you leap, and it's a good idea, to maybe, again, that people have sort of their areas of expertise that they can uh, uh, help out in that process uh, more efficiently, like an accountant, you know. I mean, if, if they're really seriously looking at, at this. I would think that they would want to look at the bank statements and see if they tie into the books and and, and so forth. And, yeah, and speaking of bankers, if they're using financing, that would be another person on their team. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> good. Well, why don't we talk about um, some basic steps in buying a business? And talk about that for a few minutes. Sure. What, what are some of those basic steps? If it's an individual, and you're considering buying a business, then it's a good idea to read about the qualities that a business owner needs to have to be successful. I'm sure there's a lot of information you could uh, find on the internet to help you with that. But a couple of key things are, uh, one, you need to have leadership abilities. Two, uh, you need to be a person who doesn't need a boss to tell them what to do. If you want to be independent, you have to be a self-starter. Mm -hmm. And you have to have the ability to just figure out what needs to be done and then take the right actions to do it. It's hard to prioritize. 
it's easy to waste a lot of time on the trivial many while you're missing the critical few items that you should focus on. If you've decided that you're willing to take a risk uh, to be in business by yourself, you are the right guy who's a self-starter, you have the acumen to look around and see what needs to be done, you really probably ought to talk to your family about it too because your family is going to be depending on it. You wouldn't want to just come home one day from work and announce to your wife that you have quit your job and you're buying a business without a little discussion first, unless, <laughs> unless you want to be sleeping in that little house that says Fido on the, on the entrance <laughs> outside. So uh, then, of course, you need to figure out what kind of business to buy. And one important consideration is, uh, is it the in, going to be in an environment that you want to spend a lot of time? Mm -hmm. Will you be dealing with the kind of people that, that you'd like to have in your life? Mm -hmm. Because you're going to be dealing with those people a lot. Uh -huh. So it's not just how much money does it make. It, I think it's a fatal mistake to pick a business by the numbers only. Uh -huh. Because if you get into a business and you really find that you really don't like doing that business, you're not going to do very well at it. It's best, the best of all possible worlds, if you have a passion and you can turn that passion somehow into a business. I've had people tell me that have owned a business for many, many years that they don't consider that they actually work because they're doing what they enjoy every day, all day long. Uh -huh. And they'd probably do it even if they didn't get paid. Uh -huh. That's the best. Uh -huh. So don't pick a business just because you uh, like the numbers. That's not enough. Um, of course, you have to figure out how large a business you can afford. Mm -hmm. You also need to figure out how much money you at need to make at least after all expenses of running the business and principal and interest payments on any debt you might incur to buy it. And then you need to go out and start looking to see what businesses are available out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about why you'd want to use a broker. I think if you're buying your first business, definitely talk to several brokers, not just one. Mm. And figure out which brokers are really going to help you, which ones are really going to put your interest first, and which ones have the inventory of good businesses that can help you find the one that you want. Mm -hmm. When you make an offer, it should be in writing. It should be on a form document such that if the seller accepts your offer, you have a binding agreement and you can proceed through the remaining steps in the process, mm -hmm. which would be due diligence, financing, getting assignment of the premises lease or a new lease for that premises, uh, possibly inspecting equipment or the building, uh, possibly making employment agreements with key employees, and understanding everything about how that business works, why people choose that business over its competitors, how you might be able to grow that business if that's your, your goal, or how to keep it earning the money it's earning if all you're looking for is cash flow. Uh, want to be sure and use an escrow. You don't want to give your earnest money deposit check to the seller. You may never see it again even if you don't <laughs> buy the business. Okay. And, uh, and then certainly get through all the legal documents for closing, publishing any required notices like the bulk sale. Uh, transfers of licenses, especially if it's a business that has an alcoholic beverage license and so on. Mm -hmm. And then training and transition. Mm -hmm. Usually the owner should train you in an operation of the business. Or if it's a franchise, of course, the franchise is going to train that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got about five minutes left and probably ten minutes of stuff to talk about here. Or an hour. <laughs> oh, let's see here. So why don't we talk about some financing alternatives for mm -hmm. a few minutes? I think that's something that people should prioritize. Uh, so why don't, why don't you <coughs> tell us a little bit about that? Okay. The most common financing source for small businesses, even up to the maybe 7 to even 10 million range, is an SBA loan. SBA loans are guaranteed by the federal government and they're made by most of the banks in California. The federal government will guarantee up to 80% of the loan in the event of a default. SBA loans are uh, maybe not the most desirable form of financing because the lender is going to lean not only the business but most of the personal, a personal assets of the, the borrower. Mm -hmm. So if you need to borrow some money later on, you may not have any other alternatives. Some people can write a check for a business, but even if they can, they usually don't want to because they get a higher return on their money if they use some leverage. Seller financing is a possibility in some cases. 
if the business doesn't have really great books and records, but you like the business anyway, maybe seller financing is the only way you can get financing. SBA lenders are going to be pretty picky mm -hmm. about the tax returns and so on. Uh, sometimes a better way to do it is to refinance real estate that you have or even sell some rental houses and raise cash. Uh, you might put together an investor group for a larger, uh, larger purchase. And then there are programs where you can buy the business within your qualified retirement plan. Mm. There are some companies out there that specialize in being these specialized uh, qualified retirement plan trustees for alternative investments. Guardian Financial is one. SD Cooper is another. You can find them on the web. This has many advantages in that, one, you're investing pre-tax dollars. Two, when you eventually grow and sell the business for a huge profit, there's no tax due on that because it's just inside your qualified retirement plan. You only pay tax when you distribute the funds. Okay. So uh, I guess I'll throw in related. Be very careful with the retirement plan alternative. Uh, there's a lot of landmines in it. Um, and uh, But I, I've, we've done uh, programs uh, on this show before. If you go to Financial Insider Weekly, uh, where we had uh, a self-directed uh, IRA trustees and so forth uh, talk about uh, that, or the custodians, I guess we call them. Uh, so anyway, we talk about alternative investments in particular real estate. We have separate programs. Um, so we're getting close to the end here. Uh, maybe you can give us some final words of wisdom. Sure. Big thing, don't try to do it alone. A lot of people are subject matter experts that are ready, willing, and able to help you. Interview a lot of them. Pick the ones that you like the best, people you have chemistry you can work with. Listen to their advice. Consider it. Check it. Like Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Uh -huh. And be sure and verify everything all the way through the process, including who you're working with, their advice they're giving you, the books and records, everything. Good. Oh, so we still got about a minute. Uh, but I think... You know, I, we've, we've raised some good points here. You know, I appreciate uh, your input uh, related to this. And I hope that people have found some things. Again, this is sort of a starting point, uh, this interview. Uh, we're, we're not trying to tell you this is the uh, be all and the end all. That's why we're giving you all of these ideas about uh, people that you need to find to help. And you might find the person that usually helps with your personal income tax return may not be the right person to help you related to evaluating a business. With that, I think we'll conclude. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>